I've got a very interesting uh, kind of clinical practice. It's a little bit bimodal. Um, and it just speaks to the fact that so many doctors do what they've been kind of trained to do from their mentors. Um, so uh, I have a large practice in complex endovascular aortic repair um, and fenestrated and branched endografts, but I also have a large practice of pelvic venous disorders, which are two totally disparate um, sort of pathologies, but that's who uh, brought me up in my training. So um, we're going to totally switch, uh, but Omar already alluded a little bit to the uh, pelvic venous disorders. Um, chronic pelvic pain is a huge issue. If you talk to OBGYNs or urologists, every specialty has their own um, kind of, uh, you know, terrible patient or, or patient that they, you know, is kind of a thorn in their side, if they will, that they don't know what to do with and they, you know, keep coming back. And, and chronic pelvic pain is, is often that in uh, OBGYN and uro urologic circles. It accounts for up to 10% of gynecologic and urologic visits. And 30% of this was previously uh, attributed to the quote unquote pelvic congestion syndrome. Um, and a vast majority of these uh, pelvic venous disorders are actually in combination with lots of other things. And I'll kind of talk about that in a minute. Uh, the differential diagnosis, endometriosis, uh, previously called pelvic congestion syndrome, pelvic inflammatory disease, adhesions, irritable bowel, lyomyoma, it kind of goes on and on. And it's because the pelvis is complex. Everything's kind of pinned in there all next to each other. And so if you, if there's inflammation in one thing, it can certainly affect uh, a lot of the other systems. Um, today, uh, we're obviously going to talk about pelvic venous disorders. So historically, this was called pelvic congestion syndrome, and it was defined as pelvic pain, chronic pelvic pain, uh, pain with intercourse and uh, pain with urination uh, with or without varices. And most patients will describe that it's worse with standing heightened during menses and often presents after multiple pregnancies. Um, this also can present in men. And so this slide's obviously kind of geared towards uh, female patients, but men also have chronic pelvic pain and they can get these other symptoms as well. And a lot of times this has been misdiagnosed as kind of chronic prostatitis. And you'll see these patients to get multiple rounds of IV antibiotics or admissions for prostatitis that never get better. And it's because it's not prostatitis. And so, um, you know, I'm not a urologist, obviously, so I won't uh, talk any more about that. But uh, these patients that, you know, are having chronic pain, think about venous disorders. Um, so now what we think about is flank pain, or and or pelvic pain, and or extra pelvic pain, so external pain, with or without varices, uh, again, worse with standing, usually worse after intercourse or after exercise. And we think that's because the uh, veins get dilated. And as the veins get dilated, then they get engorged and then you have more pooling, which causes the pain. Uh, heightened during menses, often after multiple pregnancies, although not always as we go through some cases. So this is uh, just hot off the press about two months ago. Um, this was published uh, in the uh, uh, Journal of Vascular Surgery. And uh, this is a, a multi-specialty collaborative effort, uh, global, about 15 different global societies contributed to this manuscript, including the American Venus Forum, the SVS, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, the Society for Interventional Radiology. So it was really a multidisciplinary effort to get a handle of what's happening with pelvic venous disorders and to put together a classification scheme so that we're all talking about them the same way. Because the problem in the past has been that we've put everything in syndromes, right? And a syndrome is just a constellation of symptoms. And so if you say pelvic congestion syndrome, or if you say nutcracker syndrome, or if you say any, it's like saying abdominal pain syndrome, right? If you give everybody an appendectomy that has abdominal pain syndrome, not very many patients are going to get redder because you're not treating the right thing. And so we actually have to call things by their actual names and what they are instead of putting them in these buckets of syndromes. Um, and that's this uh, manuscript is, a, is uh, the first step in doing so and is an excellent first step by, you know, an international consensus committee. So their recommendations, number one, get rid of the syndromes. 
Number two, develop a patient-centric instrument that can actually classify these pelvic venous disorders. And number three, continue the SEEP classification that Dr. Mubarak already spoke about for lower extremity venous disease. And sometimes you have both. And so sometimes you need to use both classification schemes. Um, it's a little bit into the weeds, so I'm not going to go into this in detail, but basically it's symptom, it's SVP. So first is the symptoms. Do they have flank pain, renal symptoms, pelvic pain, pelvic symptoms, or extra pelvic pain, like labial swelling or uh, uh, varicosities um, that are like in their gluteal cleft and things that are painful. Uh, v uh, corresponds to varices. So they can get renal hilar varices, they can get pelvic varices, or they can get pelvic origin extra pelvic varices. And those would be like vulvar varices or varicocele in men and or lower extremity varicose veins like in weird places like gluteal cleft or really high in the thigh that are not in the typical saphenous vein distribution. Uh, the next is pathophysiology. And so that's the AHE. So we look at the anatomy of the actual vein that's involved, the hemodynamics, whether it's a, uh, a refluxing or an obstructive pathology, and then whether it's, uh, it's non-thrombotic congenital or uh, DVT. So I keep things very sim simple in my own brain when I'm thinking about uh, these things. So there's, like I said, two basic pathologies, reflux and obstruction. And we'll talk about four different patterns very quickly. Uh, gonadal vein reflux, which is one of the refluxing pathologies, internal iliac vein reflux, which is the other major veins that drain the pelvis in addition to the gonadal veins. And then on the obstructive side, we wanna think about left renal vein compression, used to be called nutcracker syndrome, but remember we're getting rid of the syndrome. So we wanna call it left renal vein compression and iliac vein compression and or obstruction. So in order to um, highlight these, I'm just gonna go through some cases. So first is gonadal vein reflux. I think that it's fascinating that the payers will reimburse varicocele embolization in men with, uh, without a question because it's an external varics in the scrotum. But as soon as you put pelvic congestion syndrome or pelvic varices in women, the payers instantly uh, X that out. So first of all, get rid of the syndromes. Don't say that patients have pelvic congestion syndrome. Say what they have. They have gonadal vein reflux with chronic pelvic pain. And that helps us when the referral gets made uh, actually get their procedures paid for. It's the exact same thing, whether it's a man or a woman, right? This is gonadal vein reflux that causes varicocele. In a woman, it's gonadal vein reflux that causes intrapelvic varices, same pathology, same treatment. There's just a difference in, um, in reimbursement, unfortunately, but they're working on that. So this is 34 year old woman with three years of chronic pelvic pain, worse with standing, post-coital pain, post-exercise pain. She's had three children, uh, bilateral lower quadrant tenderness with no external varices. Let's see if I can play that again. This was her venogram. So this is a catheter in the left renal vein. Uh, that's filling some massive left pelvic varices. And so the treatment for that is to actually uh, select that vein, uh, fill those varices with foam, and then uh, treat the like a sclerosant foam. It's kind of like shaving cream consistency. And then you uh, coil embolize the rest of the gonadal vein. Um, this is obviously reflux, like Dr. Mubarak was talking about in this left ovarian vein uh, coming down, which comes off the uh, left uh, renal vein. Next, left renal vein compression. So you can see here that this patient has massive hilar varices. All of these things are abnormal. There's a, a thinning of the contrast as it goes over the aorta. So this is symptomatic left renal vein compression. But the deal with left renal vein compression, this patient has flank pain because they're draining their uh, kidney through all these varices, right? So they have flank pain. So the way we treat that is with left renal vein transposition. And it's just a large surgical procedure. Uh, renal vein stents don't do very well. They tend to migrate. And when they go to the heart, then you have to have open heart surgery. So um, uh, we can do this in about two hours and we actually move the renal vein down on the vena cava. Um, just another a reason why we want to stop calling nut things nutcracker syndrome is because they have different therapies, right? 
So here is also left renal vein compression, but totally different presentation. So this is a 63 year old woman with 30 years of chronic pelvic pain, not flank pain, pelvic pain, constant, but worse with standing post-coital pain, post-exercise pain, no children, bilateral lower parietal tenderness, again, no flank pain. So this is compensated left renal vein compression. So the previous one was uncompensated left renal vein compression, right? Because they're developing hilar varices. So they have flank pain, but this patient to get rid of all the pressure, instead of building hilar varices, you can see they're, they're decompressing their kidney by draining straight down into their pelvis through this massive ovarian vein or this, um, yeah, ovarian vein, this was a woman. So this patient still has nutcracker syndrome, right? But a totally different presentation, which is again, why we want to get away from that terminology and say it's left renal vein compression that's compensated with left gonadal vein reflux. Last case, uh, left iliac vein compression with internal iliac vein reflux. So this is another, um, uh, I think, uh, poorly understood kind of across the board. Most people think that left iliac vein compression causes leg swelling. It can cause leg swelling in an uncompensated way. So like left renal vein compression, if it's uncompensated, it causes kidney symptoms. Left iliac vein compression, when it's uncompensated, causes leg symptoms. But what can happen is it can start compensating just like the kidney did. So this 37 year old woman with 17 years of chronic pelvic pain, worse withstanding post-coital pain, post-exercise pain, two children. She's had two laparoscopies looking for endometriosis. She's had two years of pelvic floor physical therapy. She then went on to have a hysterectomy, still continued to have chronic pelvic pain, um, no leg swelling, no external varices, no flank pain. Her duplex showed this compensated left common iliac vein compression. And so she has a compression of that iliac vein. But as you can see, sorry, in this, you can see here, she's got this thinning of the contrast. Why won't this play? Oh, there it goes right here. So some of the contrast is going into the cava, but you can also see this refluxing pathology here, which is actually pretty subtle. It's not that... Um, uh, obvious, but what we did for her was we stented her iliac vein, coil embolized her internal iliac vein, and she literally was crying in the clinic two weeks ago because this is the first time in 17 years she's not had chronic pelvic pain. Um, and then she'd gone through a hysterectomy, uh, two years of physical therapy. And so these can be really compelling patients if they're diagnosed appropriately. So um, that's kind of a, a overview of uh, pelvic venous disorders. Turns out it's very complicated and all of this anatomy is very intertwined. And so uh, start uh, by reading that manuscript, that consensus guidelines, because it gives you a lot of great background information and hopefully we'll have more um, uh, peer reviewed data to guide therapy in each of these specific um, kind of diagnoses. So thank you.